Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. So glad that you're here today. Everybody good? Everybody all right? Good. All right. Good to see you. All right. So glad that you're here with us today. If it, again, if it's your first time, my name is Scotty. I'm one of the pastors here. I'll be teaching in just a few moments. Just showed you that video just to remind you how incredibly important it is to be an inviter. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have an incredible opportunity to do that. I'm going to kick off a brand new teaching series called Uncharted. And on September the 10th, we have something called Friend Day, and it's just a simple idea that you would invite one person that you care about, family member, neighbor, friend, somebody you play golf with, that you would invite one person to church with you. You may be looking around this morning going, well, where would they sit here at Castle Pines? Uh, we're going to get prepared for that. And so uh, there at Highlands Ranch, I want to encourage you to grab somebody and invite them to come to church with you. We'll also be celebrating our grand opening uh, here at the Castle Pines location. Uh, as you can tell, if you're, again, if you're new with us, we're still a work in progress. We've got a lot going on to get ready over the next couple of weeks. And then on that day, we're also selling, celebrating the one-year anniversary of the Highlands Ranch location. On your seat, when you came in uh, today, there's a postcard and there's just a group of little invite cards. I just want to encourage you to take that with you. Uh, maybe there's somebody that you're thinking about inviting, somebody that you work with, somebody uh, that lives down your street that you hang out with. Uh, I want to encourage you, maybe write their name on that postcard. It just simply says, I'm praying for this person, asking God that they would be open. And then I just extend an invitation for them to come with me on that big day. That teaching series I'm going to start on that day is called Uncharted. That's where the little invite cards come in. Uh, it's all about navigating the twists and turns of life. Lots of uncertainties happening right now in our world. How do you do that? How do you, when God leads you into uncharted territory, how, how do you navigate those kinds of things? So I encourage you to invite somebody to come with you. Uh, if it's your first time here with us today, I would love to invite you to fill out the Connect card. Uh, it's at the bottom of the note-taking outline you received when you came in. Fill out as much as you're comfortable with, and at the end of the service today, you can drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by. Let us know um, that you were here today. We'll simply send you an email with some next steps that you can take. We always give people the hassle-free guarantee. Nobody's coming to your house. Nobody's calling you and harassing you. We'll simply send you an email with some next steps that you can take. Also, I want to encourage you to indicate which location you're attending. It's helping us to track that. We have a Highlands Ranch location, which, by the way, can you guys help me welcome them today. So glad you're with us. Thank you. So right after the service today, uh, on the patio upstairs and downstairs, uh, we've got a few tents set up to help you find your group. Uh, here at Journey, we are so, in, so concerned with helping people connect, helping people find their people. And so a lot of us move here from different places. And when you join a new church, it's, it, it's challenging to find your people. So we do our small groups on semesters. And what that means is, is that we start all at the same time and end all at the same time. So we're about to start a semester of small groups. Uh, I recently heard we had 90 plus adult small groups that are going to be available uh, this fall. You can stop by the tent and find out all the information that you need about finding a group. I know that's a big step to take, uh, but I encourage you to stop by. They're not going to hassle you. They'll simply give you some information and answer some questions for you. We have all kinds of groups. We've got groups for men, groups for women, groups for married people, older married people, younger married people, activity groups all kinds of things. So find a group that you can connect with your friends. Last announcement is there is no church next week at Journey. We always take the Sunday of Labor Day off uh, together as a church. Summer is a very busy time. This has been the busiest summer in the history of Journey. We've had so many things going on for kids, middle school and high school students. And of course, here at Castle Pines, we've been opening a brand new facility. So we just take what we call the Sabbath week. We take off. We say, thank you, to the hundreds of volunteers that serve every week at Journey, say, hey, take the weekend off because we're headed again to the fall. And the fall is an incredibly busy time. And so we're, we're going to take a, a moment and stop and reflect and listen to God, get our hearts right, get ready for a brand new season of all the things that God is going to do. So take a break next week. Pray for the person that you're going to invite to church on Friend Day. So let me pray for us. We'll jump into the message for today. God, I know uh, in this room at Highlands Ranch, watching online, that there are people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different perspectives. Some of them come to church here every week. Some of them, this is a brand new thing for them. This is their first day at Journey. I just pray wherever we are, 
that you'll meet us right there, speak to us, encourage us, and help us to take our next steps with you. Get us ready. If you're open to hearing from God today, I invite you to pray this very simple prayer that we pray every time we come together as a church. If you're new, just a simple, honest prayer between you and God, something like this. God, would you please speak to me today? Because I'm listening. And then pray for somebody else, probably somebody you're seated beside, somebody you came to church with, one of your family members. Just a simple prayer for them, something like this. God, please talk to this person today and give them the faith and the courage to respond to you. Yeah. Broncos look good in that preseason game. Help them win the Super Bowl. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, turn to your neighbor and tell them if you're ready for fall. If you're ready for fall, just say, I'm ready for fall. If you're not, just say, I wish the summer would stick around. No, not ready. All right. Hey, we're, uh, we're wrapping up this teaching series today. Uh, we've been calling it the comeback. And what does it look like to get back to better? And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how to make progress in our life in all these different areas. I don't know about you, but sometimes during the summer, I drift. I drift from things that matter, drift from things that are important. Sometimes you drift spiritually. So in August, we've taken a moment to say, hey, how can we get back to better? We talked about how to get back to better in our spiritual lives, how to get back to better in our family. Last week, Justin did an amazing message on how to get back to better friendships. Like there's an epidemic of loneliness, especially among men. Like how do we connect with each other again? And today we're going to dive into another topic. Here's... um, Here's the key verse that we've been looking at. It's been where we've been rooted in the Scripture through this teaching. Jeremiah 29, 11. If you're a Christian, if you've gone to church for a long time, you've probably heard this verse. We quote it to one another to encourage each other. just reminds us whatever we're going through, God has a future for us. It just says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. But... Each week in the series, we've reminded ourselves that the people that are receiving these words are a group of people who are living in exile. They're living in exile because their nation has been conquered, their city has been ransacked, and they've been taken back to the city of Babylon. It's the largest empire in the world at that time, and that was part of their military strategy, was to conquer a city and to take back the best and the brightest of that city and to indoctrinate them and to include them in their community. And so about 3,000 people are brought back to the city of Babylon. And you can imagine that is really, really challenging. They don't want to be there. They want to get back to better. But in the middle of that, God is speaking to them and encouraging them, and he's reminding them that, hey, you're there for a reason. You're in this place, honestly, because you made some choices that led to this. You drifted away from me, and now you're in a place that you might not want to be. So how do you get back to better? I bet all of them were thinking, I wish we could just leave this city and go back to Jerusalem. But then God speaks to them and says this earlier in the chapter. He says, I want you to build homes in that city. I want you to plan to stay. I want you to plant gardens and eat the food they produce. I want you to marry and have children and find spouses for them that they may have grandchildren and multiply and do not dwindle away. So all of those things have to do with planting yourself. They take a long time. And he says, you're going to be there for a moment. And to get back to better, you think it's a geographic location that you have to get back to Jerusalem. But what I'm telling you is that you can get back to better right where you are that you can take whatever circumstance that you're in and you can use that moment to plant some things in your life. In fact, he goes on to say this. He says, I want you to work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about influence where we are. I want you to pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. We're going to dive into that in just a few moments. But each week, we've been doing a little special exercise where we've been talking about what does it look like to move into the future in all these different areas. And I've been asking you to do this, so play along. I want you to write down, if you're taking notes today, grab that note-taking outline. I want you to write down a couple things you might have done this each week, or it might be your first time playing along. But just write down, my current age is. My current age is 48, so in five years, I will be 53. 
carry the one. Yeah, 53. So, so I want you to do that. So if you're 16 or you're 72, where will I be in five years? And then we've been asking ourselves some questions about, we think that life will be automatically better in five years. We think our communities will be better, our families will be better, our finances, our bodies. We think it'll be better. But I have to ask myself, be honest, what trajectory am I on? Is the road that I'm on, is it leading there? Is it taking me toward the, the future that I desire? Here's another way to say that. If I continued with my current habits, activities, attitudes, behaviors, where would I be? Just look back over the last week and go, hey, what I did, how I acted, what my behavior was. If I was just to trace out that trajectory, would it lead me to where I want to be? Be honest. Look at this verse, Psalms 25, 4. It says, show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. In other words, roads, paths, they have a predictable destination. And if I take my steps on those roads and those paths, I end up somewhere. And so I want God to show me the right one. Here's another big thought I've been sharing through the series. Is, here's what I think. I think better is better than best. I think so many times, especially in our culture, we say, I want the best. But sometimes when we're trying to improve ourselves, when we're trying to get better, when we're trying to grow, sometimes best is the enemy of just getting better. Because best says, why should I even try? Best says, that's, that's a perfectionist mindset. I don't even know if I could accomplish that. But what if it was just a little bit better, just one step? In fact, that's why we call our church Journey. It's not just a cool name that we came up with a long time ago. We really believe that, that if we just take our next step, your next step closer to God every single day, there's no telling what God can do in and through you. So today, we're going to talk about this one big idea. We've talked about family. We've talked about friends. We've talked about our personal spiritual lives. Today, we're going to talk about this one big idea, and that's the idea of better influence. I don't know about you, but sometimes we look around at our community, our neighborhood, our school, our office, uh, our government, our state, sometimes our nation, and we go, what happened? How did we get so far off track? And we think, we need to get back to better. What would it look like because the ground has been shifting and it seems like morality is changing and cultural norms and what was up is now down and what was wrong is now right. And we look around and we go, what, what do we do? How do we handle that? How do we influence my little world to be just a little bit better, right? Because sometimes it's defeating. Sometimes it feels broken. Sometimes it's like, I don't know what to do. I'm in despair. But let's go back to that verse in Jeremiah 29.7 where uh, Jeremiah the prophet is writing to them and he he, this is almost kind of some counterintuitive information for him. We're talking about a group of people who've been ripped from their homelands and placed in a brand new culture. They're in a place that they don't, they don't necessarily agree with the values and the norms. There's enemies, there's hatred, there's, we've been stuck in a, a new place kind of against our will. And it feels like all of the way that we see the world has shifted. And now they're thinking, we just need to get out of here. But then the word of the Lord comes to these people and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to work for the peace and prosperity of the city, the community, the neighborhood, the school, the office where I sent you. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. In a very simple way, God has you where you are at this time for a reason. He strategically planted you there. And he says, I want you to do something. I want you to, come on, work for, that's a strong word, because work is hard. I want you to work for, I want you to strive for, and you to seek out, and he says these two things, peace and prosperity. Now, there are two words in the English version of that, but in the Hebrew, it's one word, shalom. It's a Hebrew word that means peace and prosperity together. It means wholeness. It means to put things back together for good. He says, I put you there in your community, in your surrounding, and the people that you're connected with because I want you to make a difference, and I want you to work for that. It's really hard. I also want you to do this. I want you to pray for it because the work part is your part, and the praying part, that's my part. 
like God's favor, God's hand, the things that I can't control, I have no idea how that's going to go, I'm going to put that into God's hand. So I'm working and I'm praying. Here's another way to say that. Here's a question we want to tackle today. You might not have got out of bed this morning going, man, I really hope we talk about this, but I think it's important, is how, how can we work for the peace and prosperity of our community? How can we work for what God wants to do? How can we influence, again, my neighborhood, my school, my office, my friend group, this community, our state, our nation? How can we do that? Because we look around and sometimes we go, man, this feels broken. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You're kind of looking at me like, I don't know what he's talking about. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you see something that's broken and it doesn't feel like it's working quite that well, we have some opportunities to do a couple of things. We can, we can respond just by complaining, and we all do. Hey, this isn't working. I don't know what happened. Man, we've really gotten off track. And just complaining. We can, we can tear things down, right? We can just go, hey, I'm just going to rip this apart. We can jump on next door, which is Satan's social media. Anybody get the next door app and think, man, this nothing could go wrong here where people can anonymously say whatever they want about their neighbors. Can you imagine if you did that in real life? Like if you just came out on your front porch and just started shouting the things that people type on next door, just read it out loud. Yeah. We can retreat, which is what we do sometimes. As followers of Jesus, we just say, hey, this that, that it looks like there's no hope there. We need to pull back, get in our little holy huddle, have a little bunker mentality, us four no more, and we'll just do our thing and let the world go to hell. That's a, that's a strategy. We can revolt. Like, by God, we'll take back our rights. We can fight. Because typically what happens when things are going wrong, there's always this progression. Well, they, there's always a they, you know what I mean? There's a they at work, there's a they in the government, there's a they, they in the family. Well, they, man, if they would just, and then the, our next progression always is, well, we, well, we ought to do something about this. Someone will complain to you and say, we should do that. What they mean is you should. <laughs> but listen, influence, better influence always starts with me. I can't control what anybody else does. I can't control what their decisions are. I can't control how they handle that. What about me? What am I going to do? Here's another way to say that. It's not my fault, but it is my responsibility. Listen, this is all a little sidebar, but this, if you grabbed hold of this statement and the challenges in your life, because what we want to do is go, well, that's not my fault. But listen, most of the time, it is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to do something about it. It's a responsibility to behave in a different way. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how do I leverage my influence. Now you may be saying, I don't have influence, and you would be wrong. Because everybody has influence. Good or bad, big or small, everybody has influence. There's a, there's a group of people in your circle that your voice is so incredibly important. How you respond, how you behave, what you do. There's a group of people that are so incredibly important to what you have to say about that situation. Everybody has influence. We just want our influence to be better influence. So I want to give you a couple of big ideas, and I want to give you some really practical things to think about what does it look like to influence people for the message of Jesus. So, number one, a person of influence has integrity. In other words... Uh, what I say matches what I do. You've heard that. Like integrity is, hey, I'm the same person out in public as I am at home, like behind closed doors. I, I have integrity. What I say matches how I live my life. Why? Because integrity leads to trust. Someone can trust you and, and not agree with you. You can have influence in someone's life simply by being a person of integrity and saying, this is what matters to me. This is what's important to me. And then that matches up with how I live my life. And then you have this power just by how you live to influence other people. Uh, I'm a, this, this time of year, I'm a massive college football fan. Um, I love college. I love all football. Uh, it's chess with gladiators. But I, uh, I love 
I love college football in particular. In fact, next weekend is like Christmas for college football. If you're a college football fan, all the games kick up and start. So I just come running down the steps in my footy pajamas early in the morning, <laughs> watch games all day. Uh, but I've been watching uh, this past week. It's a documentary on the Florida Gators back in the mid 2000s, 6 through 7, 8. And uh, they won a couple national championships, but the team was crazy. And the coach was crazy. There were literal murderers on the team, all kinds of crazy people. And then right in the middle of that was Tim Tebow, right? <laughs> and here's what I found out like, they interviewed all kinds of people. And to the person, they would say, you know what, we didn't necessarily agree with Tim. He came from a different lifestyle, a different background. His faith was so paramount, but he was the same person in the club as he was in the clubhouse. He was the same person on campus as he was in the locker room. He was like, we didn't necessarily agree with him, but come on, we trusted him to be our leader. That's what integrity does. Okay, number two, a person of influence connects with people. So often just to pull, the, we can pull back when we, we see, when we're discouraged about how a situation is going and we can say, hey, I'm just going to worry about me and mine. But a person of influence connects with people. We try to build bridges of relationships so that I can make a difference in someone's life. Now, this is a challenging thought, but the call of Jesus so often is to love people more than they love you, which is incredibly simple but unbelievably challenging is that, hey, I want to connect with you. I want to understand you. I want to empathize with you. Like, it's not just about saying what I think about this situation. I want, to, I want to care about you. If you want to influence someone, you need to care about that person. Number three is uh, a person of influence helps people. I know that's a very simple thought, but normally what that means is if I'm helping somebody, it means I have to sacrifice. It means that I have to give of something that I have to that person. My time, my, my investment, my, my, my wisdom. I, I, I need to help that person along. So I have integrity and I, I care for people and, and then I, I actually help those people. I go out of my way to be a person of influence. Why? Because that's what God has called every single follower of Jesus to be. That he's put us in strategic places and he says, hey, I want you to make a difference. I want you to build. I want you to have families. But I want you to work for the peace and prosperity of the community that I put you in. That's why you're there. So I want to take a look at a handful of verses in the New Testament that are kind of mirror verses to this. Of what does it look like to be in a culture where you want to influence that culture with primarily with the message of Jesus? the good news and the hope of what Christ can do in our lives. And so we're going to take a look at some verses in Colossians. If you're new to the Bible, the, the book of Colossians is written to a group of Christians in the city of Colossae. And there, Paul is in prison for speaking up about his faith. And so he's there, and he's in, and he's, he's in prison, and he's writing a letter to these people who are in another city. And he's encouraging them with these all kinds of thoughts. And he gets to the end of that, and he's talking about what does it look like to share a message, to be a person of influence in a community that might not understand exactly what you value. And he says this. He says, hey, I want you to devote yourselves to prayer. Now, that sounds familiar. That's kind of a mirror of Jeremiah. Hey, pray for the city and being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message. I want you to remember that. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He says, I want you to pray that God would open a door for us to share this message, to be people of influence. Why? Because opening a door, if God opens it, is a lot better than you, come on, kicking it in. That is, it doesn't go well. If you're the person on the other side of that door where the door is being kicked in, you automatically get defensive and go, no thanks, I don't want to have anything to do with that. You come and kick my door in, I'm going to go Scotty Karate on you right now. And no. This happened, this, I was thinking about this verse uh, on uh, Friday. I was, uh, I was running errands with my sweet wife on Friday. It's a little date day. We're riding around, and we're going to all the places. We go to Costco and this place and Goodwill and that. And then we're going to head over to Sprouts. And we're going to Sprouts, and my wife is picking something up. She's going through the checkout line. Now, I have a wooden crate in my hands. I just bought it at Michael's. 
And I'd walked in, waiting on my wife, standing there at the checkout line, standing there. Uh, a gentleman comes over, older gentleman, and says, hey, what you doing in that crate? <laughs> I said, this is going to go good. Uh, I said, I, I'm going to put some stuff in it. What you going to put in it? <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, I got to be real nice because people know me in the community. So I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, and he says, you're going to put some wine bottles in there. I said, no, I think I'm going to put, I got a bunch of books at home and I need to like put them in here. And he goes, oh, good, good. You, they don't want us to read. And I'm like, oh, this conversation is about to go real good. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so fun. We're going down a trail right now. And so he begins to spout off a bunch of conspiracy theories to me about Fauci and vaccines. And they don't want you to read and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just standing there with my crate waiting on my wife. I'm like, I did not want this to happen. Um, and so I'm trying to give him the, yeah, man, you know, this little number right here. You know what he did? Right here. Right here with me. <laughs> I leave, walk out with my wife into the parking lot. He's following me out. I'm thinking, and I just kept thinking about this verse. Like, he's trying to open a door that's not open. And listen, sometimes we do that, especially in matters of faith. Like, we just try to push the door open, kick the door open, think if we could just say the right words and, and put all the phrases together that somehow we would convince somebody. But what if... What if we just lived our life of faith? What if we just were people of integrity who connected and helped, and then we pray for God to open the right doors, and then we have an opportunity to influence? The next verse say, says this, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. And then he says this. This is so important for us. He says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. This is, this again, is such good advice to us. If you have grown up in church, when people started talking about what does it look like to share your faith or to be an evangelist, a lot of us, we pull back from that because we think if you're not necessarily good on your feet with words or, hey, I don't like to strike up conversations with strangers, we pull back from that. But he says, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Now, the word outsider could, could be an offensive term, but really what he means is someone who has a different set of beliefs than you, someone who is going down a different spiritual path than you. He says, be wise in the way that you act. That's really important. I say a lot here at Journey that many people don't have a problem with Jesus. They have a problem with the way that his followers act. So we have to be very careful about using our wisdom about how to approach people in spiritual conversations. And he goes on to say it like this. He says, let your conversations always be full of grace. Wow. Some of you walked away from God for a long time because the conversation was not full of grace. He says, season with salt. That's important. We're going to come back to that in a few moments. So that everyone may know how to, so you may know how to answer everyone. So let me give you three questions around this idea of what does it look like to be a person of influence, particularly with what it looks like to be a person of spiritual or faith influence in your circle and in our community. So number one, what's my, what's my purpose? First question, what's my purpose in this? God has placed me where I am for a reason, and he's given me a purpose. Now, there's three words I want you to remember around this. They're, they're all throughout the New Testament, but it's this idea that God has called me to be a witness. God has called me to be a witness of what he's done in my life. Now, what is a witness? Someone who can testify to what they have seen, heard, experienced. That's all it is. And all of us do this all the time, right? We talk about what we love, what we've seen, what we've experienced, right? Uh, if I go to a great restaurant, you're going to know about it. I'll tell you. I'm a foodie. Like, hey, we went over here. We tried this. You'll love it. You talk about what you love. If you bump into my wife and have a conversation with her, within 32 seconds, you're going to hear about Collins, our granddaughter. It's going to come up. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Horseshoes. Collins loves horseshoes. I bet she'll ride horses one day. Like, that's, that's happening. We talk about what we love. Jesus calls us not only to be witnesses, but he uses these two words. He says, I want you to be salt and I want you to be light. Okay? So if you've been in church before, you've heard these phrases. But he says, listen, I, 
you are the salt of the earth. Now, salt in the time of Jesus was very valuable. It wasn't just for tasting, I mean, flavoring our food. It does do that, but it also was preserving. It kept things from rotting, and they didn't have refrigeration. Salt was so valuable that people were paid in it. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, he's not worth his salt, right? Uh, Salt and and salary come from the same word. So valuable. He says, you're very valuable, you need, to, you need to add flavor to conversations. And what does salt also do? It leaves us thirsty. It leaves us thirsty for more. You ever had that big giant bucket of popcorn at the movies and like if you didn't have something to drink? like Yeah. So he says, I want you to be light. Why? Because people are drawn to the light. This is my behavior, my attitude, the way I say things, the way I speak. Is it full of grace? Is it magnetic? Does it draw me in? Second question for today, when it talks about what, what does it look like for me to be a person of influence as I use my integrity and I care about people and I help them, is here's another really specific question, is where's my place? Now, what does I mean by that? I mean, write this down beside that if you're taking notes today. Write down the word already. Where am I already? You live in a neighborhood or an apartment complex, a dorm you're already there. You shop at the same places over and over again. You go, to, uh, you, you go to the same coffee shop. I'm already there. I already play golf with these guys. I already get together and have ladies night with, with these ladies. I already do this. Where is my place? Now, this is so important, and sometimes we don't believe it, but God has strategically put you where you are. The house that you live in is not an accident. The person you sit beside in algebra class is not an accident. The person in the cubicle or the guy that you're sitting on the plane next to or the person that you share a territory with, it's not an accident. God has placed you there because he thinks, I'm going to put one of my children to be a witness, to be salt, to be light, to be an influence in that person's life. Now, when you carry that around, there's a responsibility to that, right? But to say, where is my place? Why? This is so important. Because influence grows with proximity. The closer I am to someone, the more leverage I have. The closer I am, the more I care, the more I connect, the more I help, the better opportunity I have to help someone. So there are a lot of you in here who you coach Little League sports. What an incredible opportunity to impact some young boys and young girls and their parents. A lot of you, you have... You have uh, people who work for you, employees, that, hey, they come to work and they get a paycheck and they've got a job to do, but they may not be there with you forever, but you have an opportunity to influence them and change their lives by how you treat them and what you point toward that matters. Influence grows your proximity. These principles work, by the way, whether you're a president or whether you're a papa. They work whether you're the, the governor of the state or, you, or you're a stay-at-home mom. Like, you have enormous influence. And who, who are your people? Who has God placed in your home, next to your home? Who has God put in your family? You might be the first follower of Jesus in your family. There's lots of us here at this church. And... God has reached you first, and now he's saying, hey, what, can, what could you do to influence your family? What could you do to influence your friend group? Who are your people? Now, when we talk about this, honestly, because when we talk about evangelism or sharing our faith or being an influence for God in our community, a lot of us get weird images of that. I mean, if we're on, especially if you grew up in church, you kind of got the Rambo the prophet image going on. Like, I'll just knock on your door, and by God, I'll tell you what's going on. But what if it's different? What if what Jesus was trying to communicate and get across was way more natural? What if we just simply talk about what we love, what we've experienced? Uh, Probably back, I think it was in July, uh, I, my wife and I were going to dinner with one of our really good couple friends, Tim and Katie. Uh, we're driving down. We're going to a Mexican restaurant in Monument. There's lots of Mexican restaurants here, but Tim said, you've got to go eat here. And I'm like, let's go. 
So we hop in the car with them. They pick us up. We're driving down I-25. Now, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, in fact, I coached our little boys in youth league football when they were in the third grade. Uh, and so they grew up. And my son's 23 now. And so they grew up. And they played all the way through high school together. And that's when I met Tim. Tim's been going to the church for a long time. They're in our small group. We're going to dinner. On the way down, Tim, uh, he's excited because he started a new hobby. And he's telling me all about it. He's like, you're not going to believe it, but I started, I started jujitsu, okay? And if you don't know about jujitsu, okay, my, as my wife calls it, jujitsu, uh, if you don't know about jujitsu, it's a martial art. Uh, it's a lot of grappling. So you can see you're kind of wearing this karate gi thing, and then you're mixing it up with somebody, and then you're wrestling. It's a lot of these holes and submissions and chokes, and yeah, it's martial arts. And he starts telling me about it. He's like, I am loving it. It is amazing. Tim's a little, a little bit older than me. And he's like, I'm having the best time of my life. I'm, I'm working out and I'm, I'm, I'm sweating like crazy. And then he turns and he goes, you would love it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm an introvert. I don't like physical touch. I'd love to get together with men and wrestle <laughs> like strangers. I just, I can't. Like, lock up legs, and that's, hi, my name is Scotty. You know, like, that seems, come on. He goes, no, 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 I'm telling you, you got it, you got to try. And so he just keeps talking about it. He goes, I'm telling you, his moves are so good. He goes, I'll do this move on you when we get to the parking lot, the Mexican restaurant. He goes, I'll show you. I'm like, let's don't do that, man. Uh, so we talk about it through dinner. He won't stop talking about it. And anyway, uh, we, the next time I see him, we talk about it a little bit more. So I get curious. And so he, I was like, I, I look it up online and I'm watching the videos and I'm finding out, hey, what do you, how much does this cost? Where do you wear? How far? It, what's the class like? And then so I make the mistake and I'm like, uh, okay, I mean, I'll try anything. I'll go with you. And he's, he was so excited. Yes, this is incredible. And so I drive there early in the morning. It's like a 630 class drive there early in the morning, and then the hardest part was getting out of the car and walking into the building. It's so awkward, and so they give me this little karate gi to put on, you know, and I, I, I put it on, and, but hey, here's the deal. Tim's there. Tim's there, and me and Tim wrestled. <laughs> it was so awesome. Uh, a bunch of other guys, and uh, can I tell you, I love it. I'm hooked on it. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I got been going all month, every like three or four times a week. I'm there. Uh, I just bought my own karate gi, or I just got it in the mail. I'm so excited. So, it's nuts. My wife's just making so much fun. She's like, I can't believe you're doing this. All right. I'm not telling you where it is because I don't want anybody. <laughs> Anybody to come? Uh, listen, Tim was an evangelist. All he did was, I love it. it I'm having, it's, it's so good for me. He didn't say, you need it. You're out of shape. You should try this. He just said, I love it. I think you would love it too. He made it sound so attractive. <laughs> he was like beaming about it. And I said, okay. I'll give it a try. That's evangelism. That's being, come on, a person of influence. He had integrity. He wanted to help me. He, he wanted to connect with me on the ground. It was so <laughs> weird. But anyway, why? We want to be people of influence, and we make it really hard. But it might be September 10th and going, hey, I'm going, and God is making a difference in my life. I, I don't even know. There are three times in the New Testament where someone meets Jesus and then they, they invite their friends. And then their friends start asking all these questions and they say, I don't know. You just have to come and see. Because there's something about being in the presence of God with other people. Why? Because we never know. We never know how one conversation, one word of encouragement, one invitation, one act of kindness will change someone's life. Why? Because God wants you to be a person of influence. Let's get back to better influence. Life-giving influence. 
it can make all the difference. If you're new to our church, I say this a lot. I'm standing here on this stage because a 16-year-old girl in my English class said, would you go to youth group with me tonight? I had never been to church before. She said, would you go with me? And it had, it's made all the difference. It changed my life. One invitation. You never know how God wants to use you. Let's get back to better. Let's pray. God, just thank you that you've placed every single one of us strategically with friends and family, and you want us to be an influence. Sometimes that's a heavy responsibility, but I pray it would just be the overflow of our lives, that your work, you're working in us, and that we would just invite people to come and see, to experience what we have. Maybe right now you would pray for a friend, someone that you're thinking about inviting. Just say, God, would you open the door? Just like Paul said there, would you open the door for me to be an influence? Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, I came to church today and a friend invited me. And, and what I need more than anything is a relationship with God. I need what you're talking about. I need to experience that. I need to start following Jesus. And if that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity, just like I had when I was a 16-year-old kid, to make my first steps of faith toward God. If that's you, just say something quietly to God. Just push out all the distraction and say one thing. God, I need you. Just say this. I believe in Jesus. I believe he lived for me died on a cross for my sin and rose from the grave. And the best way I know how, I'm asking you to come into my life. Forgive me and help me to take my steps with you. In Jesus' name, amen.